Give God a hand. Give Jesus a hand. Give Jesus a hand. Give Jesus a hand. Come on, lift your hands up. Lift him up. Yahweh. Thank you, Jesus. You're the answer, God. You're the answer, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you for being in this place right now. Thank you for being with us right now, in Jesus' name. He's here, people. He's here. He's here. Why don't you begin talking to him? Don't wait for the word. Why don't you just begin speaking to him? Why don't you tell him what you need? We're talking about the Holy Ghost today. He's eager to touch you. He's eager to move in your situation. Yahweh. hands up Yahweh speak to him face to face right now he's in the place now come on give him a hand he's watching he's listening give him a hand welcome him in the building come on with the clapping of the hands welcome him we welcome you holy spirit we know you're here we acknowledge you we love you we need you holy spirit you're the reason we came today thank you for being here amongst us today go ahead and give somebody a hug as you take your seat today if I could get this microphone in the monitors. Thank you so much, Max. Get the microphone in the monitors. That's a decay right there, bro. My God. We are talking about the Holy Ghost. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I love talking about the Holy Ghost. If you don't know me at all, I just, I mean, man, I'm fine with preaching about this all year. And you know what? He's not an entity. He's not a cloud. He's a person. He's here with us right now. He's on stage helping me right now. He's out there amongst you as you are worshiping, speaking to you, tapping on you, wanting to do something in your life. He's involved. He's not obtuse to your situation. He's not outside of it. He's not, he's not ignoring you. He's not trying not to listen to you. He wants to be more involved than you want him involved. He wants to be more the answer than you even know that he wants to be the answer. He's the Holy Ghost. He is the most powerful person who's ever been. Somehow he fits inside of your body. This message, I want every person, let's welcome right now all of our campuses. Arizona, let's welcome them. Come on, clap for them. Let's welcome Pomona. Let's clap for L.A. All of our campuses are joining us right now. Hey, wherever you're at, and if you're sitting at home and you're in your pajamas, don't feel ashamed. Just get to church the next time. Praise God. But you're going to have an amazing service today. I'd like you to get out your Bibles, if you have a real Bible, in the building and at every campus. Especially if you're at home, go to your bookshelf, get a real Bible. If you have a phone, God will forgive you. But it's all right if you got a digital Bible. It's fine. It's fine. But, but just understand, like, you can carry a phone around and open your Bible and nobody's going to say anything. But if you sit among people and you get that big leather book and you open it up, people are going to be like, Whoa. Something different about a real Bible. If you got a real Bible, put it up in the air. All my real Christians. One, two, three, four. We got about a hundred real Christians in the building. Okay. Hallelujah. I want you to turn to your neighbor at every campus and right here. And I want you to say these words. Not without the Holy Ghost. Turn to the other neighbor. Not without the Holy Ghost. Come on, say it. Pomona, say it. Not without the Holy Ghost. Everybody. 
I want you to look at yourself now. Put your hand on your chest and say, not without the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 1, 4 through 5, verse 8. Are you ready? Let's get in the word. Once, this is Jesus speaking, when he was eating with them, he commanded them saying this, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised as I told you before. Don't get up and do anything until you have him with you. If you go now before you got him with you, you will fail. They've been watching Jesus. This speech is happening after three years of watching Jesus do miracles. After watching God's power. They're fired up. He even gave them authority. They've cast out some demons already by this point. They've done some stuff. They're ready to go. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to leave now. That's just, it says it made them sad. They're like, Jesus, what are you talking about? It's time to take over. You just rose from the dead. Let's take over. Everything's finally happened. You rose from the dead. Nothing like this has ever happened. The gospel's incredibly powerful now. Why are you leaving? And then he says, but I don't want you to go anywhere. So now you're going to go and now we got to sit at home too. You don't want us to do anything. No. I want you to wait. Let me just say this. People are terrible at waiting. Can I be honest? How many of y'all are good at waiting for anything? No. We don't want it. We want it now. We get on our phones. Give me the score of the game now. Give me the information now. Call me now. We're a now society. Give it to me now. I'm not going to wait for marriage to get, have sex. Are you kidding me? I want it now. I'm not going to wait to get comfort from the Holy Ghost. He doesn't come when I want him to. I got my ice cream in the freezer. I'll just go get comfort now. We have so many comforts, the comforter can never come and comfort us. We got comfort food. There's literally a whole type of food called comfort food. <laughs> you know how many people I've prayed for had to repent from an idol of food? They depend. Uh, here's the thing. Well, I don't drink. I have people, I don't drink. I don't, I don't do drugs. Okay, well, the Christian drug is what? You get into the, Exactly. Hey, if you want to know where the greatest restaurants are in town, go ask pastors. <laughs> Woo! Right? Man, we know how to get that comfort. But how many of us, instead of running over to the newest buffet, are running to go get to the taco stand, or running to get on our knees and get with Jesus and be the comforter, the Holy Ghost? He says, I don't want you to go. Why can you not go? Jesus said, don't leave. Because if you go now, you're going to fail. He said, but after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. So why do you get power? To be my? Why do you get power? To be my? You get power to be a witness. So if you go out without this power, you're a terrible witness. You see that? We have churches all over who are nice people, really great programs, no power. This is the problem with that. People who live in a real world with real problems need real answers. The best thing you have to give somebody, a ch child is sick. And dying. And the best thing you have to give them is, I'm so ho sorry, honey. This must be God's will. He'll take you home in peace. What you need is. How about somebody who's addicted to drugs? Alcohol. Those demons are calling out to them. They're trying to disconnect. What are you going to give them? If you don't got power, you'll give them another program. Then another piece of paper. Then they'll sit down for six hours to talk to you about things that are not going to do anything for their lives. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with programs as long as the power of the Holy Ghost is the center of it. But if you don't have power, you are an entertainment agency. You are a personality contest. When we don't have power, we argue in our churches about the color of the carpet thinking it's going to bring more people. When we don't got power, we argue about the fact we have 200 lights or 50 lights. We argue about if there's enough haze in the building. We argue about if we have the seats. or We, we argue about things that do not matter. Do you know Jesus did not have a sound system? He went out and no less than 5,000 people followed him everywhere he went. And he never had a lack for crowds. He didn't have a marketing team. He wasn't paying them thousands of dollars. They weren't posting the greatest graphics and designs. Nothing wrong with any of that. But I'm just letting you know, you don't need that for God to have a move. The only thing you need is the power of the Holy Ghost. You see, listen, if you get delivered and you've been on crack cocaine for years, let me just tell you what's going to happen. You get delivered. You could have tried to preach to your family forever about all the change you've been having and how great God is, but they don't believe nothing. But when you get delivered of that, they're going to be like, where you go to church? I got to come with you. I know how you used to be. Power touched you. Now I got to have what you had. The greatest witness you can have to your family is you need to get breakthrough. You need to get free. You need to get changed. Don't leave. If you're not going to be able to be an effective witness, you'll be all talk, no power. You'll be trying to witness to people on the street. You'll say the best sermons you got from YouTube. You'll repeat everybody else. You're going to memorize Pastor Marco's sermons, and you're going to speak them, but it's not going to happen the way it does when he does it. Why? Because he has taken the time to get on his knees and get some power. Just because you repeat my words doesn't mean you'll get the same effect. The Holy Spirit is not fooled even though people are. Let's look at what the Bible says. There's two anointings in the Bible. 1 John 2.27. Look at this. There is the anointing. It says, look at these words. As for you, the anointing, the special gift, the preparation, which for you have received from him remains in you. And you need no one to teach you. So there are two anointings. There's the anointing that's been talked about in Acts 1. That's the anointing that comes upon you. That's not for you. That anointing that comes upon you is for the need of other people. It has nothing to do with you. You are simply a container. If I had a water bottle, I would show you. The anointing will come upon you. You'll get a word of wisdom. You'll, you'll have the power of healing. Why? Because there's a need. God loves people and he wants to meet the need through you. But it has nothing to do with you. Just like when you put water into a bottle. You'll put it in the bottle. You'll pour it out of the bottle. But the water does not affect the bottle. It's just a container of the water. You are a container of God's power and presence. When he comes upon you, it's to do something for someone else. It's to be an answer to someone else's problems. But this anointing right here in 1 John 2, 27 is anointing that's within you. Somebody say within me. Within me. This anointing is the anointing that actually gets your conscience from a seared, tainted state. And puts you in a place where you're sensitive to God. This anointing is what has kept you saved. Without this anointing on the inside, you would have already cussed out everybody, gone back to your old ways. And maybe you did, but you came back because there was something about the anointing that is in you. It is something you have to protect. You got to protect the sensitivity of this inside of you. You can't let people mess with this anointing in you. You can't go around to the places you used to go. It's going to mess with it. You can't listen to the same stuff you used to listen to. It's going to mess with it. You cannot. There's an anointing that helps you abide. It literally keeps you not just saved, but keeps you in God's will. It keeps you inserted in God's will. It keeps you in the momentum of the Holy Ghost. You get in God's timing when you listen to this inside. But see, you got to protect it. You can't just let anybody speak and talk negative around you, gossiping about people, lying all over the place. You might have to separate yourself for a little bit because you have to protect the anointing on the inside. You don't have to protect the anointing upon you. Let me tell you how I know. 
Because the Bible said God gives gifts and he does not repent of those gifts. In other words, when he gives it to you, he will never take it away. But that is scary. Why? Because people will be moving in the anointing. And they got the gift at some time. They were fasting, praying, they were serving God. But somewhere along the journey, they forgot about the giver. They forgot about Jesus. They gave, began to depend on themselves. They began to feel like a lot of stuff was happening. They began to get popular. They got famous. Whatever started happening. And they forgot about the giver. So what happens is the anointing on the inside of you has diminished. The Holy Spirit has withdrawn. But the anointing that is upon you keeps working. Because it's never been about you. It's been about them. So here's the problem. You'll see people getting healed. You'll get words of wisdom. You'll be able to have things happen through you. And you will think because of that God is pleased with you. But the fact that they got healed had nothing to do with God being pleased with you. It has to be with you were the only vessel in the room he could use. And he loves them enough to do it through you. But you can still not be. You haven't talked to God in a year. You don't have a personal relationship with the Lord anymore. You can't hear his voice, but you have mistaken it by the results you have seen and thinking God is pleased with you. There's an anointing upon you and an anointing within you. Now listen, if you do anything that you do apart from the Holy Spirit is not accepted by God. Let me prove it to you. First Chronicles 3, 10, 13, 9 through 10. Listen, when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled. David is bringing back the Ark of the Covenant. And Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the Ark. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah. And he struck him dead because he laid his hand on the Ark. So Uzzah died in the presence of God. What is going on? The Ark represents the presence of Jesus. The Ark is on a move. It's moving on wheels. It's moving on a cart. Listen, there's a move of God happening. The presence is moving. A man tries to allow his flesh to touch the move of God. God will never allow man's flesh to touch the move of God. Leviticus 14 talks like this. Look at this. It said that the priests, you can read it later, the priests would have to go in and they're, in order for them to do their duties in front of God in the tabernacle, they'd have to do two things. They'd have to get blood and oil and they'd have to put the blood of the oil on their earlobe. They'd have to put it on their big thumb and they'd have to put it on their big toe. Why? Because your ears represent hearing from God. You will not be able to know or hear God's voice until first the blood of Jesus has been applied. Meaning you belong to Jesus and have been saved. And the Holy Spirit is on you and in you. And your work, he will receive nothing you do with your hands, which represents your work. Unless it first, look, before it touches the skin of your flesh, it must go through the blood and the oil, which is the Holy Ghost. So everything you do has to first be applied while he can see the blood and he can see the Holy Ghost. Nothing you do apart from the Holy Spirit in your own flesh, your own strength, and your own ideas pleases God. Woo. Adam could not even fellowship with God. Now listen, there's no sin in the world. But the Bible says that God fashioned out of the dirt. Look at this. He fashioned. He was an artist. He starts making the legs. He starts making the arms. He then fashions the head. Everything there. But he can't talk to him yet. Until he does this. He can't communicate and fellowship with him. Because God is literally so holy. Listen. Listen. He's so holy, even though there's no sin yet, he still can't talk to flesh without the Holy Ghost. So he has to breathe. The Bible says his spirit. He breathes his spirit into the man. The man inhales the breath of God, and the first breath of man is not his own. It's borrowed breath from the chest of God. God breathes in his nostrils. And he breathes out the breath that came from the chest of God. 
Why? Because God wanted you to know you can't even live life without him. You can't begin this life without him. You can't do a day without him. You got to be dependent upon God. Galatians 3, 3 through 4, Paul is talking and he says there are people who do something very foolish. Let's look at what he says. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the spirit, why are you, L.A., over there in L.A., why are you trying to become perfect in your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it wasn't in vain, was it? Paul is saying, and this still is in our churches now, that there are people who understand they never could have gotten saved without the Holy Ghost. For sure, you know you couldn't have saved yourself. But they come up and say a prayer. They get saved and then they look at God and say, Lord, thank you for that. I couldn't have done that, but I got it from here. I'm going to be holy on my own now. I'm going to prove, God, I'm going to make you so proud. I'm, I, I, wait, you're going to be impressed with me, God. Wait till you see what I do for you. Look how amazing I'm going to be. God, I promise, I'm going to impress you. You ain't never seen somebody like me before. I just got a reality check for everybody. Every campus, every person, listen. I want you all to look at me in the eyes. It's very important you get this reality or you're going to miss it. You cannot fulfill God's will. Look over here. See if you guys get this. You cannot please God. You need to let this sink in. You can't please God. I just want to let you know over here, just so you guys know over here. You are a terrible example of a Christian. have nothing to offer God. Okay, just let it sink in. I promise I'm going to move forward. But if you do not get this, you, okay, fathers, you cannot be a good father. Husbands, you do not have the ability to be a good husband. But... Oh, my gosh. You see, it, can you imagine, just go with me in time just real quick. If you were on that boat, imagine you were in that boat with all the disciples. The storm's raging. Ah, you're freaking out. Oh, uh, and Jesus is napping. Okay. You're just, ah, you're thinking you're going to die. You're looking back at Jesus. When is he going to wake up and do something? You're just like, what is going on? Jesus. Ah, and he's just like. Right? Finally, you go over there and you're like, Jesus, get up. We're going to die. What are you doing? Storm's going on. Jesus gets up. Lightning, thunder. <laughs> he walks out on the end of the boat. Peace be still. Yeah, yeah, your emergencies are what I nap in. <laughs> Do you think it would have changed your life to see that? What about he's on the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon that's ever been preached, right? He's up there saying stuff that's blowing our minds. Every single one of us, our heads would be exploding, the revelation, you know, we can't handle it. Too amazing. I mean, the things he's saying nobody's ever said before, right? Right? He gets up from preaching and he starts walking down the mountain. And a leper comes this way. A leper walks up to him. Now remember, a leper is more contagious than COVID. Can I say it over here? A leper, leprosy is more contagious than COVID. You don't touch lepers. But Mark had to make sure he put it in there. John did as well when they wrote the gospel. And they said that Jesus did not speak from a distance because he was social distancing. He did not go around the corner and be like, um, can you hear me? I'd like to pray for you to be healed. Just stay over there, please. He didn't remove his mask. He walks up to him, and the Bible said he reached out and touched him. Jesus was not afraid of getting what the man had. The man was going to get what Jesus had. So he goes and touches him. Do you think it would have changed your life to see it? 
How about, let me give you one more. How about we're out there and we're all so hungry, all of us. We're all sitting here and we're like, man, we didn't eat no lunch. We're getting hungry. Matter of fact, there's 5,000 men. Not to mention women and children. So there's around 10 to 13,000 people. And we're all sitting outside. It's hot and we're all hungry. And this little boy walks up because he sees Jesus hungry. And he's like, hey, Jesus. I have five loaves and two fish. Maybe you could have a meal. And the disciples are like, what are we going to do with this? Oh, my gosh. Jesus, uh, we're embarrassed to even say this, but this boy... He brought you this. Maybe you can chow on it. You know, we, we'll, like, cover you so nobody sees you eating. <laughs> Jesus is like, go sit down. Go sit down, disciples. You're not getting it. And can you imagine being 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 people back? And you're looking like this, trying to see Jesus stand up with this basket in his hand, and he's lifting it in the air. And he's going, thank you, Father. You've given us everything we need. You're thinking, this dude's crazy. What is he doing? I'm hungry. But then you're still watching, and this man reaches in the basket. And you're like, look at what is he doing? Reaching in the basket, and he pulls out a loaf of bread, and he breaks it, and he gives it. Then he breaks it again, and he gives it. Then he breaks it again, and he gives it. And he starts doing this, but he's still breaking it after two minutes. And he's still breaking it after five minutes. And then he's still breaking it after ten minutes. Pretty soon he pulls out the fish. And now he's breaking the fish. And he's still breaking it. You said, what is going on up there? What, how deep is that basket? What is happening? Not only do you eat till you're full, there's 12 baskets left over just in case you want second or third helpings. Do you think it would have changed your life? If you said yes to any of those things, you're wrong. Because the disciples, when it mattered the most, they deserted Jesus, ran from him, and betrayed him. You see, it didn't touch them even though they saw him walk on the waves. All they got from it was a shock, not a life change. It didn't shock him when he had preached all the sermons, the most powerful sermons. It says that when he left, they would take him aside and say, what did you mean by that? And he was like, wait a minute. You don't even get it? I get it if they don't get it, but you don't understand? You can see miracles, power. But you will not be transformed by it. Why? Because Acts chapter 2 had not happened yet. You can't even understand the Bible without the Holy Ghost. You can't understand sermons without the Holy Ghost. You won't be changed by anything you see of power without the Holy Ghost. You will be entertained, but you will not be shifted because the Holy Ghost is not illuminating God's voice. But when the Holy Ghost came, Zechariah 4, 6, it's not by force. You see, they saw the force. It's not by strength. They saw it when he calmed the winds and the waves. That was power. That was strength. They saw it when he broke open the, the loaves and the fish. That was power. They saw the force. They saw the strength. But it wasn't that that changes you. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. You see... The man, Peter, who denied Jesus three times after the Holy Ghost came in, became so bold. He walked out of that room, the upper room. He stood on there on a shame and preached a sermon so powerful, 3,000 people got saved in the streets. You see, the Holy Ghost takes cowards and makes them bold. You see, it's because of the Holy Spirit that God can work with misfits like you and me. You see, over there, you see Pomona, it's because of the Holy Ghost that God could use a man like Noah, even though he was an occasional drunk. It was because of the Holy Ghost that God could use Jacob, knowing that he was a con man and getting over a deceiving spirit. It was because of the Holy Ghost God could use Moses, even though he was a murderer and had a stuttering tongue. It's because of the Holy Ghost God used Rahab, even though she was a prostitute. It's because of the Holy Ghost God still can use Jonah, even even though he ran in rebellion from God's voice. Have you ever rebelled against God's voice? 
It's because of the Holy Ghost he used David, even though he was a murdering, wife-stealing adulterer. And it's because of the Holy Ghost he could use Paul and make him a leader in the very church he killed two months earlier. Without the Holy Ghost, God can't work with us. So, so you know this statement you hear? I can't believe God hasn't given up on me. Why would God keep working with me? Why does God not give up on me? Well, let, let me give you some clarity just real quick. It's not actually about God not giving up on you. Actually, he did give up on you. He never had confidence in you in the first place. You're too weak. Why? Romans 3.23, put it up. What does it say? We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glorious standard. He already knew what he was getting himself into. He never had confidence in you. It's not actually God not giving up on you. Listen, when you receive the Holy Spirit, God the Father now has a partner he can work with. When you receive the Holy Ghost, this is what's going on. God doesn't necessarily not give up on you. He doesn't give up on himself in you. See, the Holy Ghost, as long as the Holy Ghost is in you, you are one obedience away from a breakthrough. As long as the Holy Spirit is leading you, every area of failure in your life has an expiration date. Every area you fail has an expiration date attached to it as long as the Holy Ghost is there. Because God always has someone to work with when you have the Holy Spirit. You see, if it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, he couldn't have used someone like Abram. Abram was supposed to be the father of many nations. Abram needed to have kids. Abram's 99. You're not really having a lot of action at 99. Not really a lot of child making going on at 99. It said his loins were dead. He's, he's dead. You know, he's not really thinking about that no more. He's thinking about sheep and other things, you know, just trying to count his, you know, and all that. You know, Abraham's walking around. Hey, Sarah, you know, I mean, <laughs> he's just trying to keep his joints mobile. You know what I'm saying? You're stretching. You know? But he's like, Abram, you're not what I want you to be yet. So I'm going to change your name. Because Abram is not the father of many nations. Abram is not the man who's going to have children as much as the stars. Watch me, Abram. Look at my face. I'm going to make you a new name. And here's what it is. Abraham. Abram. The same when he went back with Adam and breathed. The spirit. He took the spirit of God into that death and went. In a name changed. He rose and he said, now you can defy. Because here's the deal. Your nothing that you think is seemingly nothing with God, nothing you can offer God is always something in the hands of God. Your nothing is something in the hands of God. Whoa. So see, God actually looked, Job said, at nothing and he hung the world on it. He looked at nothing and he said, that's a great place to put the world. <laughs> nothing is something with God. Genesis 1, 2, look at this. The earth was formless and empty and void. Darkness covered the waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Why is he hovering? There's darkness. There's voidness. There's death. Because the Holy Ghost is attracted to the areas of your life that are in chaos. He's attracted to the areas of your life that seem like nothing is there. He's attracted to the voidness. Why? Because he's the creative one who has the answer. He comes closest to you when you are in your darkest and hardest times. He comes closest into a place when you don't understand what's going on. When you seem confused. He's ready to give you the answer. He's not intimidated by your problems. He loves to be the problem solver for you. My God. Jesus speaks. Look at what he said. Now I'm going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate will not come. Guys, it gets better than me. 
huh? The disciples, what are you talking about? It's better that you go away. You're saying it gets better than you? Come on now, come on, come on. Jesus, what's going on? Why are you leaving, number one? And number two, who is this person that you're going to send in your place that you say it's better? We saw you walk on water. We saw you break the bread. And make, we saw you do it. Who could be better? He said, guys, you don't understand. I, I've been in, in one body. I can only walk where I go and people can come and see me. If you wanted to see Jesus, you'd have to get on a flight, go to Tel Aviv and then take a taxi all the way to wherever he was. And you'd have to have a list already written out of the questions you want to ask him. And you'd be waiting in line for months trying to get to him. And, and, and by the time you got up to him, hopefully all your questions would be said because you wouldn't have another chance for possibly months at a time. But the Holy Ghost isn't trapped in one body. He's in Africa right now. He's in Asia right now. He's in the Inland Empire right now. He's over at the Arrowhead camp campus right now he's over in Arizona right now he is there listen he is Jesus unlimited the Holy Ghost is Jesus unlimited he talks like Jesus he walks like Jesus he's just like Jesus but he's unlimited when the spirit of truth comes John 16 5 7 3 2 14 he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory. This is Jesus speaking by telling you whatever he receives from me. Let me tell you a secret about the Holy Ghost. He loves to help you bring glory to Jesus. He loves to help worship Jesus. He loves to help you fast and pray to get closer to Jesus. He loves to help you have wisdom so that you'll know Jesus. He loves for you to open the Bible and invite him in so he can teach you about Jesus. He's obsessed with bringing glory to Jesus. And he wants to do it through you. 2 Corinthians 3.18. So all of you have had the veil removed and can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. Listen, this is what he's trying to make you. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like who? More and more like Pastor Christian? More and more like Pastor Gavin? But more and more like? And he will change us continually into his glorious image. How is God going to make us? How is the Holy Spirit going to make us into the image of Jesus? Ready? Here we go. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Don't you realize your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with the high price, so you must honor God with your body. Let me tell you, let me, let me, what's going on? The Holy Spirit is going to make you like Jesus one day at a time, but he's going to do it from the inside out. Let me show you what he does. You see, you see these houses here? These are gorgeous. Like, man, if I could have this house, I mean, this must be millions and millions of dollars. This is the way that we want to be. I want you to real quick to look at your hands. Every person lift up your hands and look at your, look at your own hands. Just look at them. I want you to think just real quick, what have those hands done in your lifetime? Have those hands ever gotten you in trouble? Now, I want you to take that hand and put it on your mouth. Has that mouth ever said anything that was not pleasing to God? Has that mouth ever gotten you in trouble before? Now, I want you to look at your feet. Just look at your feet. Have your feet ever taken you to places you regretted going? This is the body we're talking about that he wants to work with. But this is what we would like to do as Christians. We want to give God the beautiful. Oh, Lord, don't you see how... It's manicured and beautiful. Look at my pool, God. I keep it clean all the time. Look at the pristine paint. Do you see, God? I'm not just beautiful on the outside. I'm gorgeous on the inside, too. Lord, I want to impress you. Or, or, or maybe, you know, God, you're a little bit more stately and proper. And you say, you know, Lord, I, 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 if you came and saw the way I'm like, I'd like to offer you the most beautiful. I'd like to give you the best, Lord. And I know that you have to work with everybody else. I know they all have problems. <laughs> they all have issues. But me, I mean, I mean, Lord, you know, I, uh, but, but here's the deal. The Holy Spirit is not interested to live in any of those homes. Let me tell you, the only homes the Holy Ghost lives in, fixer-uppers. He only wants to live 
in fixer-uppers. Look at that. You don't even have a roof, no covering. Oh, look how gorgeous this is. He looks and he says, I see the addiction. I see the pain. I see all the worry you're in right now, but that's my perfect home. Oh, look how gorgeous this home is. Look how awesome it is. I know that they've been cussing. I know they've been abused. I mean, but look at this. I could do something with those windows and, oh, I can make up the side. I could give it a fresh coat of paint. You see, God chose you and your vessel as his perfect custom home. God didn't choose the mansions and the good, beautiful. Because understand, he's already lived there. He lived in the body of Jesus. Think about this. The last home the Holy Ghost came from was the body in the house of Jesus. No sin. Nothing that would ever grieve him. But he's like, no. I want those hands. I want that mouth. I want those eyes. They look places they're not supposed to, but I can clean them up. I want those thoughts. You think you're going insane. Let the Holy Ghost touch your mind. I promise he'll make you sane again. Those feet, they've taken you places you don't want to go, but he can take these feet and walk you in a path like you've never dreamed. He can get you to your purposes. <sighs> You see, listen to this. He's the landlord, but all the houses were purchased by another man. <laughs> He's the landlord of the house, but the houses weren't purchased by him. They were purchased by another man. His name is Jesus. He purchased you with his blood. <laughs> you see, this is crazy because in the Old Testament... There was no indwelling. There was no coming inside. There was, a, there was this, all it was was they would come upon, the Holy Ghost would come upon people for a small season of time to do one act of power and then he would lift. Samson, he'd come upon him. He slayed a thousand Philistines. David, he came upon him. He took down Goliath. Uh, Saul, he came upon him for a season. He was able to prophesy and know what was going on. He came upon Elijah. Fire came down. He would come upon you for short seasons. But he could never break into you and make you his home. Why? Because there was no Jesus yet. Because there was no cross yet. Why? Because 1 John 5, 7 through 8 says this. The spirit, the water... And the blood, all are witnesses and they all agree. You see, the Holy Ghost needs the blood of Jesus. The Spirit is the Holy Ghost. The water is the word who represents Jesus. You see, the only way that he could come to you is he had to come through Jesus. What do I mean? Let me ask you this question. Who is the first person? Who is the first person in the New Testament that was filled with the Holy Ghost? Everybody shout answer. What do you think? Okay, I hear a lot of Jesus. Who? Everybody, okay, I hear one person. If you said Jesus, you're wrong. The, not Mary, uh, not, the first person who was filled with the Holy Ghost in the New Testament was John the Baptist as a six-month-old baby in the womb of Elizabeth. What do you mean? Well, let's, let's read it. Here you go. Look at it. Luke 1, 39 through 41. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea. Zachariah, she entered the house, greeted Elizabeth. And look at the sound of Mary's greeting. Elizabeth's child leapt within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the... Why? Because John the Baptist had a connection to Jesus. He was supposed to testify of Jesus. Look at this. The advocate I will send. This is what he says in John 15, 26 through 27. The spirit of truth. The father, he will come and testify about me. You must also testify about me because you have been with me since the beginning. You see, if you want to be qualified to testify about Jesus, the reason he had to come in John the Baptist is because John the Baptist was going to testify about Jesus. You are unqualified to testify about Jesus without the Holy Ghost. He had to fill him from the very beginning because the destiny of John the Baptist intertwined with the destiny of Jesus. And God the Father will not allow his son to be represented by anyone who does not have the Holy Ghost. John replied, John 1.23, 
I am a voice shouting in the wilderness. Clear the way for the Lord's coming. The next day, John 1, 29 through 30, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said a man is coming after me. He's far greater. Listen, listen. John the Baptist could recognize Jesus when nobody else announced Jesus. Why? Because the Holy Spirit recognizes Jesus. The Holy Spirit is looking for Jesus everywhere. He's looking for Jesus in you. He's looking for Jesus in a church that he can dwell in. He's looking for people who will lift up Jesus. He is attracted to people who love Jesus. You see, the Spirit comes into Jesus, but we still don't have him. Ben, come on out. The Spirit comes into Jesus, but we still don't have him. It took the breaking of Jesus' flesh. Let me explain this to you. The Spirit of God in the Old Testament was in a box called the Ark of the Covenant. It had to stay in that box. But then Jesus comes, is born of a virgin, lives a life, conquers sin through not falling to it, even though he was tempted in every way. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon and in him. It goes from a box into the body of Jesus, but we still don't have it. You see, it's a big deal for God to come out of heaven. God, the Holy Ghost, to be transferred from heaven. How is he going to get in you and me? He goes from heaven to a box, from a box in the body of Jesus. And watch what happens. Jesus is being nailed on a cross. Crown of thorns in his head. He's on the cross. The Bible says the soldier comes and pierces his side. Blood and water. The anointing is strong right now. Blood and water flows out of that piercing in his side. Why? Because the heart of Jesus, the physical heart, burst inside of Jesus' chest. When he pierced it, blood and water came out because when the heart bursts inside of your chest, blood and water mix and flow. You see, the heart had to burst so that the church of Jesus could go in and take the place of the heart that he once had. Because the blood and water flowed out, the church could go in and now we are found in Christ. We're now found in Christ. So you see, the Holy Ghost can now be in us because we are now in Jesus. Why is it Jesus' image? That he's making us like. Why is he so obsessed with Jesus? Why do you need to know this so much so the Holy Ghost can work in your life with your kids right now? So the Holy Ghost, the answer that you need, you got to know what the Holy Ghost is attracted to. Because when you know what he's looking for, you'll get the most help. He's trying to make you. Why is it the image of Jesus? John 1.32, John said, I saw him come down. The spirit descended like a dove. And remained upon him. The Holy Spirit came down and remained. You see, the reason why he's trying to make you like Jesus is because Jesus is the Holy Spirit's favorite person. He loves the personality of Jesus. Jesus never did anything that would grieve the Holy Ghost. He never, never, never did anything that made the Holy Ghost have to fly off. Can you imagine if we acted like Jesus did with the Holy Ghost? If we were aware of the dove. Can you imagine if we walked being careful of the dove? You would walk slower. You see, the Holy Ghost loves the way Jesus speaks. When he spoke, he never grieved him. He loves the personality of Jesus. He loves the ministry of Jesus. He loves the attitude of Jesus. He loves the habits of Jesus. He loves how Jesus was compassionate when everybody else was pushing people aside. He loves the vision that Jesus had. So he's trying to make you more like Jesus so he can use you the way he used the body of Jesus. You see, 
If you want to have results like Jesus had, the Holy Spirit is going to make you more like Jesus. Because the more you become like Jesus, every piece of you that you allow him to transform, every when you allow him to take over your tongue and you stop gossiping and you fill it with the words of encouragement like Jesus, he's going to work through that mouth because it looks like Jesus. Every time that you take your eyes, take them off of the things you know you're not supposed to be seeing and allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify you. The Bible says that it's the sanctifying work of the Holy Ghost. He'll clean your eyes so you'll be able to see visions you'll have dreams you'll be able to have look at a person and know what's wrong with them not looking at them to judge them but looking at them to heal them you're going to be a group of healers we're going to be a church to heal the world because you look like Jesus what would happen if you walked with the dove in mind would you speak differently to your kids if you knew the Holy Ghost was right here would you maybe take a break and not have that argument with your wife? Postpone it for a little bit when you knew the Holy Ghost was right here. The Holy Spirit is not mad at anybody. He just wants to use you. He wants to help you. <laughs> I'm going to close with this and we're going to pray. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 12. This is so amazing. I'll do this at another sermon some other time. God has revealed all the things to us by his spirit. For the spirit searches out and shows us God's deep secrets. No one knows the thoughts except the person's own spirit. No one knows the thoughts of God except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us you hear understand there is a humongous vault a safe full of benefits that Jesus paid for on the cross for every single one of you with your names on it there is a vault all the healings are in the vault all the forgiveness is in the vault all of the breakthrough you need in relationship it's in the vault the wisdom you need in the vault the power over the addiction that keeps taking you down it's in the vault it's all there. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible said, is the one who has the master key to the vault. He's got all the benefits that Jesus paid for, and he dispenses them to you. He has access, y'all. He's got access to all the healing you need. He's got access. The Bible says he has all the access to the knowledge of the Father. He's got all the access to the knowledge of Jesus. He lives in you. He lives in you. What does that mean? That means that all the answers you need are not as far away from you as you think. They're just right here. They're just right there. The answer you need is just right here. You see, it's in the vault. And here's what I'm going to preach about on Wednesday night. And this is what I'm going to close with. I'm coming back on Wednesday. Do not miss it because this is what he's asking every single one of you. And here's what I want to challenge you with. It's not necessarily important that you know personally that you make yourself available and know the man who put everything in the vault. You need to know him. But understand you'll have everything, access to everything he has if you'll just make friend with the vault keeper. Make friends with the one who has the key, and you have access to everything that he has. This is what he's asking every one of you, and this is what I'm going to preach on Wednesday. He only needs one thing from you. You're standing in front of it. You want the benefits on your family, your kids. This is a question the Holy Ghost is asking us. What's your password? What's your password? Wednesday, I'm going to talk about that. This is what it is. What's your word that you have that will allow you to pass through? What's the word that I can work with that will allow you to pass through to get everything you've been desiring? Wednesday, we're going to talk about how to know the word and how the Holy Ghost works with it so he can let you through to all the benefits in that safe. Give God a hand right now. Give God a hand. Now listen, this is what we're going to do. Really, really important. I want the altar team at every campus to come up. Altar team at every campus to come up. Don't leave me yet. We're going to pray for something really powerful right now. This is a special prayer for every person in the building. 
I'm going to pray for you right now. This is Arizona. Stay with me. Pomona, stay with me. Everybody, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and then I'll dismiss you all. I just need the altar team at every campus to come up. If you have not received, maybe you know Jesus. He's inside of you. The Holy Spirit is with you, and now he's in you. That's awesome. But the Bible is very clear that there are three different baptisms. There's the baptism of repentance. That gets you saved. There's a baptism in water. Maybe you've been water baptized. That's awesome. And then there's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is where it comes upon you in power and you get a new language. If you want that, I need you to come up right now. Say, I want the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm ready for power in my life. Get up from your seat right now and come up. Come on, give my hand as they come up right now. We're going to pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost right now. Come on, come on, give my hand. They're coming from the back with the evidence of a new prayer language. Come on, we're going to pray for you right now. Look at them coming up. You need power. You need power. You need power. You need power to be an effective witness. You need power to be an effective witness. Come on, they're still coming. They're still coming. Spread out. We got people all the way up here. Come on, crowd up close. Come up close. Every campus, let them come up. We're going to pray together, and then I'm going to release you. I'm just going to start the prayer. So just a moment. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Now listen, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to say as the Bible tells me, we're not going to take long to do this. The Bible instructs me on what to do. As a minister of the gospel, I happen to be the one preaching right now, so I'm going to do this. Pastor Marco could do that. Anybody could do this. As a minister of the gospel, I'm simply going to say something very similar. It's what they did in the Bible. I'm going to reach out my hand. I'm just going to agree with you. You're going to reach out your hand back to me. And I'm going to tell you these things. So put out your hand toward me right now. This is just a symbol of agreement. There's nothing weird that's going on right now. Every person who's out there, just put out your hands. It's just a symbol that you're with them, you agree with them. That's all this is. Now, I'm going to look at you guys in the eyes. If you're supposed to be up here, you better get here quick. Don't let anything keep you from this. So this is what's going to happen. Every campus, I want you to put your hands out right toward the screen right now because I'm going to agree with you as well. I'm looking at you right there. I'm going to start the prayer with you. We're going to pray for the baptism of the Holy Ghost to come. And I'm going to say this very, very simple thing. Everybody looking at me. This is what the Bible tells me to say. Nothing crazy is going to happen. I'm just going to say it. In the name of Jesus, be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. All you got to do is just receive it in faith. Every campus, receive the Holy Spirit right now. Just receive it in faith. Now, we're going to activate it because I believe you just got it by faith. So remember this. Please be aware of this. Hope will get you nothing in the kingdom. Hope does not get you the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You cannot be healed by hope. You get healed by faith. You get the baptism of the Holy Ghost by faith. What does that mean? Hope is always in the future. It's for something in the future. Faith is always now. It's for knowing that you've already received it because Jesus paid for it on the cross. So this is what you need to do. Do not hope you're going to get it. Right now you need to know you're about to have it. It's, it's yours already because Jesus paid for it. So what we're going to do is simply receive it. The way that we receive anything is we have to take a step of faith. Our step of faith is very simple. We're going to be worshiping God in English. We're going to sing Yahweh just a few times. I'm going to count to three. When I count to three, what's going to happen is we're going to ask you to stop praying in English and we're going to allow you to begin to speak in a language you never spoke before. I promise you, listen, you're not going to come from your head. It's not, you're not, you don't know these words. It comes from deep side. Okay? John, Luke 737, John 737. Out of your belly is going to flow rivers of living water. It's going to come from your spirit. So don't be looking at your mind to understand what you're saying. It doesn't. Your mind is going to get surpassed right now. You just want to receive it from God. It's simple receiving, just simple faith. So right now, let's lift our hands. Every campus, lift your hands right now. And let's begin worshiping God with these words. Yahweh, we're going to sing it. And then I'm going to say it. And we're going to begin praying. Just engage with Jesus. Praise him right now.
every eye closed. Two, you're going to jump off. You need to begin to allow it to come out of your belly. Three, open your mouth right now. Lift. Ta, ta, pa, pa. Open your mouth. There you go. Receive, receive. Grand Baba, it's inside of you. Let it out. It's inside of you. Let it out. Come, Baba. There you go. You're receiving it right now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Praise God. Yes. Come on, open. There it is. There it is, ma'am. You got it. Let ta da da Open your mouth. Do not be silent. That's the only way. Be open your mouth. It's faith. You're saying, God, I receive this right now. It's not coming from your mind. Right outside. Yes, Sata. Take the step. I promise God will meet you there. Look at all these people getting it right now. Come on, just receive. Receive. God has paid this gift. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. This gift is for you, your family, and all who are afar off. It's for you. It's for you. See, this isn't just gibberish. You're getting your original language. You're getting the language of your homeland. You're getting the language of heaven. You get to communicate with God right now. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit right now. Let the power of God touch you. Some of you right now, allow that deliverance to happen. It's coming out. When the Holy Spirit comes in, He removes what is in His way. Thank you, Lord. We're going to take one more dip. All of you have gotten it. That's awesome. But let's take one more step of faith. Sing Yahweh. Yahweh. Everybody in English. One last time. Yahweh in English. Everybody in English. Come on. Let's reach out for Yahweh. Rafa. Come on, campuses. Come on, LA. Elohim. Worship him. Worship him in Arizona. Worship him in Arizona. Worship him. up your mouth shock out of over keep it moving keep it moving there you go there's more there's more there's more we see every single campus right now I release you in the power of God continue to minister to the people right now God bless you all come on come on come on she caught out of our yes yes receive it receive it receive it there's the deliverance right there right now lifted right now every hand lifted listen this is the beginning of a new series today we're just opening the door I'll be back with y'all on Wednesday we have incredible speakers coming throughout this entire thing to be able to bless you to talk to you about the Holy Spirit I would really encourage every one of you do not miss a Sunday or a Wednesday why Wednesday nights are specifically about flowing in the gifts. I'll be prophesying to people, for instance, on Wednesday, we're going to be laying hands on the sick. If you know sick people, bring them here. We're going to get a chance to do that. Prophet Rob Sanchez is going to be here. He'll be prophesying. We have all kinds of gifts. We got Gabriel coming for deliverance. There's all, this is your time to get a breakthrough. Take advantage of it. This month, bring people. Bring people. Every person, hands lifted. God bless you. The face of his face shine upon you. We bless you right now. May his countenance shine upon you. May you have the joy and that he will give you peace. And right now, from your back to the front, I want us all to say thank you, Jesus, right now for 30 seconds. Come on, tell him thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit. He's spoken to you today. He said something to you today. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. We're going to continue to minister to these people up here. But you are all dismissed out there. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Continue to minister here.